very pleased to present Professor Ahmed Gibril, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Mansoura University, who will be talking about ESHRI guidelines for poor responders. Professor Ahmed, please. So, thank you very much, Professor Mona, for your nice uh, moderation of this uh, webinar. Today, I'll be speaking about ESHRI guidelines for poor responders. Uh, Ten years ago, people were speaking about poor responders and there were no consensus about what's the meaning of poor responders. So after that, in 2014, there was a consensus and there was a, uh, what we call Bologna criteria for poor ovarian response. People uh, think that women above 40 years old, women with previous poor ovarian response who produced less than three oocytes, with conventional stimulation protocols, people, uh, women with abnormal ovarian test, uh, is literally speaking, antral follicle count less than five to seven, or AMH less than 1.3, and later on, th this criteria were modified to 1.1. Bologna criteria nowadays is used to classify a group of women that yields less oocytes after ovarian stimulation. But because there were some concerns that uh, poor responders are a heterogeneous group, there are many women who are included in this group, but has different criteria. For example, in Bologna criteria, there were no difference between women who have normal ovarian reserve and then they had, they subsequently have less oocyte yield. And those women who you predict from the start that they have poor ovarian response. So the, later on, there was what we called uh, Bosidian criteria or what, uh, what's, uh, uh, what's had been introduced to the, classify this group of women. There were four Bosidian groups, group one, two, and three, and four. If a woman have an ovarian, uh, if a woman is less than 35 years, also, it's maybe long to group one or three. If a woman is above 35, then it's group three, uh, group two or four. So, if a woman has good ovarian reserve and then she has IVF and then she produced a small number of oocytes, less than four oocytes, then she will belong to group one or two according to her age. And then, if she has not had IVF yet, and then you do some uh, test to predict the response, like my colleague uh, Sankara has, has spoken about AMH and antral follicle count, beside her age, then you can classify her according to group three or group four. Because uh, the issue uh, has been introduced last year to give some highlights about how to give stimulation, how to manage IVF uh, patients. And for particular, this group of patients, there was some specifications. For as regard controlled ovarian stimulation for poor responders, everybody is using either the antagonist or long agonist protocol in most cases. So with the antagonist protocol is much better than the long agonist for this group of patients. Actually, the answer is no, it's not. Uh, the, the, Ongoing pregnancy rate was the same between both of them and also the live birth rate was the same for both. So you have, to, you can use either the antagonist or the agonist because they are equally recommended for predicted bull responders. And to speak, call back again what we said about Bosidian criteria. So predicted bull response, so we are speaking about group three or group four. Some people may think that short agonist protocol, protocol may be uh, better than antagonist protocol. And back to a meta-analysis and systematic review that was uh, produced, that was published by Zio et al. in 2013. They found no difference in going pregnancy rate between the two groups. So there was no statistical difference rate in clinical pregnancy rate and hence Antagonist and short agonist protocol are the same. After publishing this uh, systematic review, the uh, guideline 
producer uh, discovered two other uh, randomized trials that were published after that systematic review and the meta-analysis. One of them by Chimbrini, uh, Chimbrini et al., who found, uh, who was uh, comparing the clinical pregnancy rate between the cycles with antagonists compared to those with short agonists. There was no significant difference in the number of all sites. However, clinical pregnancy rate was significantly higher than the uh, higher uh, than with the short agonist protocol compared to the antagonist protocol. The other uh, randomized trial was done by our uh, speaker here, Sonkara et al. in 2014. But uh, because it, the primary outcome was not about uh, comparing live birth rate or ongoing pregnancy rate, so it was about comparing uh, whether the uh, which protocol long agonist or short agonist or antagonist protocol produce more sites. And they found that the antagonists show higher, pregnant, higher ongoing pregnancy rate. But adding these two studies to the meta-analysis by Zoe et al did not produce significant difference between antagonist and short agonist protocol. So what about the ultra short protocol or the microdose flare up protocol? Two randomized control trials were identified and they had 90 and 44 poor responders were recruited in these two trials and there was no difference in clinical pregnancy rate. So using antagonist or agonist protocol are equally the same. So what about the dose used? In a systematic review by Sarah Lanson in Cochrane, they, she tried to find out what's the optimal dose for stimulating women in conventional protocols, uh, whether 150, 300, 450, or 600. Actually, when they compared 150 to 300 or 450, there were no difference in pregnancy rates. However, women who received 300 international units had more oocytes than those who received 150. And because the number of uh, oocytes retrieved is nowadays considered an important outcome, uh, especially in this group of women with poor response, so they think that 300 international units is much better than 150. And uh, they compare 300 and international unit with 400 or 450 and 600. There were no difference. So they choose 300 international unit to be the standard and nobody should exceed it. Although they are questioning whether there is benefit as regard clinical pregnancy rate and ongoing pregnancy rate between halving this dose to 150, so 300 and international unit, nobody should exceed it. What about mild ovarian stimulation protocols? My click Sinkara has spoken about mild ovarian stimulation. In 2017, our group in Cochrane has published this uh, systematic review about oral medication, including clomiphene citrate or, or aromatase inhibitors with gonadotropins for controlled ovarian stimulation in women undergoing IVF. And then another meta-analysis and systematic review by my friend Willie Martins from Brazil, we're discussing the same matter. And we reached at the same conclusion together at the same year that clomiphene citrate alone or in combination with gonadotropins and gonadotropins alone are equally recommended for poor responders. And these are the recommendation by the ESHRI guidelines. To see from where this guideline recommendation came from, this is the only study comparing clomiphene citrate alone uh, compared to FSH in conventional cycles. And you can see that there was no difference in pregnancy rate between clomiphene citrate alone and uh, compared to the agonist FSH protocol. Pregnancy rate where the relative risk of having pregnancy is 0.7 and the confidence in interval between 0.2 up to 2.2. So there is no difference. Uh, in cycles where you clomiphene citrate added to gonadotropins FSH and in modified cycle where you, uh, sorry, and uh, when you add antagonist to the cycle to control for LH rise, 
this is compared to short agonists. There were three randomized trials and the, th the aggregation of them together in a forest plot showed that there is no difference between pregnancy rate. If you use this protocol uh, compared to the short agonist protocol. Another RCT that was not included in the meta-analysis uh, that was published in 2016 showed the lower clinical pregnancy rate with clomiphene citrate protocols compared to no clinical, to, to compared to no clomiphene citrate. Mm -hmm. However, this trial was not added in the meta-analysis, but I tried to add it and there was no difference till now. What about litrozole? or aromatase inhibitor. This is the meta-analysis by Abishji Joe et al. in 2017, the group was Wellington Martin, and it showed no difference between protocols where letrozole is added uh, to stimulation compared to other protocols. However, the recommendation by the ASHRI was the addition of letrozole to gonadotropins in stimulation protocol is probably not recommended for predicted poor responders. And they give the justification for this because in the trials where letrozole is used in IVF, letrozole, ad, uh, addition of letrozole to FSH in a GNRH antagonist protocol did not improve the efficacy of ovarian stimulation. There is no studies comparing letrozole alone compared to gonadotropins in IVF. And again, as she said, the trusor is off-label for ovarian stimulation and safety concerns have been raised regarding possible teratogenicity. So although the trusor might be effective or as effective as conventional agonist protocols, it is not being recommended for poor responders. What about modified natural cycle versus microdose uh, agonist flare protocol? The use of modified natural cycle is probably not recommended over conventional protocols. And this recommendation came from one RCT that compared 125 poor responders women, and there was no significant difference in pregnancy rate. It was 6%, 6.1 versus 6.9. Uh, what's about the new uh, stimulation protocol called new stimulation or double stimulation in poor responders? The ASHRI guidelines acknowledge that this protocol should only be used in the context of clinical research. Actually, this is a promising protocol for producing more oocyte within the same cycle. And we do have two prospective trials and five retrospective studies that report increasing the number of oocytes with the use stimulation. There was comparable pregnancy rate from all sites uh, obtained in the follicular phase and in the luteal phase. However, there are no RCTs comparing this double stimulation with the two conventional stimulation. So we need to wait a little bit and this dual stimulation should only be used in the context of clinical research one of the considered side effects or the disadvantage of this protocol is the mandatory freeze all of oocytes or embryos. And for this, pro uh, for this group of patients where you have very little amount of very little number of oocytes subjecting embryos to freezing, one or two embryos reduced, so many people would question this. Now, I will not go through uh, pretreatment uh, uh, medications in the, and their effect on IVF outcomes in poor responders because the evidence is like Dr. Adil Shafi uh, was speaking, adding combined con uh, bells is not recommended in, the G, uh, in GNRH antagonist protocols because of reduced efficacy. As Professor Adil said, in the general population, it leads to decrease in the uh, uh, live birth rate. Also in poor responders, it leads to a reduction in the live birth rate. So in poor responders, do not use the combined bills before stimulation. What about using GNRH antagonist? Uh, using the GNRH antagonist before ovarian stimulation in a delayed start gonadotropin protocol is probably also not recommended. And because, and uh, as you can see, the live birth rate, clinical pregnancy rate, and the clinical 
pregnancy rate in this uh, three RCTs show very low quality of evidence and there was no difference in pregnancy rate. So the recommendation is not to using them. So now we came to that juvenile's use in IVF for poor responders. These are substances that the, uh, you use during stimulation and you think that it may increase the uh, live birth rate. What about growth hormone? Using growth hormone before or during ovarian stimulation is probably not recommended for poor responders. This is the recommendation, okay? And it's, it is a conditional recommendation. However, meta-analysis of nine RCTs have shown a proven evidence of significant increase in pregnancy rate, or I'm sorry, in live birth rate upon using growth hormone. The increase in live birth rate may be between two, 25% increase and up to two folds and a half increase. So yes, growth hormone might lead to an increase in live birth rate. However, you have, we have to be cautious in this, and this is what the board and history guidelines have adopted. Because most of these RCTs are being conducted before 2011, where there is no consensus on what's the meaning of uh, poor responders and everybody was using his own poor, respond, uh, poor responder definition. So uh, despite a possible beneficial effect of, poor of uh, growth hormone on, uh, poor, in poor responders on live birth rate, the evidence is of too limited quality to recommend its use nowadays. So again, it might be, a, 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 it might be an uh, item for research and it might prove to be effective in later years. And the uh, authors of, our, of the guideline has addressed that studies were underpowered and definition was poor uh, response varies the, and was heterogeneous among studies. So let's wait and see, but growth hormone might be uh, a good adjuvant later on. So what about DEHIA or dihydrobiandrosterone acetate? Again, like uh, growth hormone, the use of DEA is not recommended. Although, uh, live birth rate, as shown by a meta-analysis of eight RCTs, might be improved upon using DEA. But the recommendation is it shouldn't be used now because they have a lot of concerns about the studies. They have a lot of concerns about how many months should be dehydrogen and uh, dehydrogen used before the IVF cycle and the studies show a great heterogeneity. So the recommendation is to wait, although it might be used later on. What about testosterone? Uh, use of testosterone is probably also not recommended like dehydrogen and Although many studies have shown that it might work, nowadays uh, there is uh, a larger study using transdermal testosterone batches, okay, and we are waiting for the results of it. But currently, use of testosterone is not recommended. What about using aspirin before or during ovarian stimulation? It is not recommended. It doesn't lead to any increase. As you can see, the relative risk is crossing one, so it might lead to harm, it might lead to increase in live birth rate, so there is no significant difference of using it. So don't use it. As a conclusion, in poor responders, you can use the antagonist and the agonist, they are both eff uh, equally effective. Clomiphene citrate alone or in combination with gonadotropins alone are equally recommended. The addition of letrozole to gonadotropins in stimulation protocol is not recommended. It's unclear whether a higher gonadotropins rather than 150 is needed for predicted bull response, but we, a gonadotropin dose of 300 is not recommended, uh, higher than 300 is not recommended, so you use 150 up to 300. The use of modified natural cycle is probably not recommended over conventional stimulation protocol. Dual stimulation is promising, but should not be used outside the context of research. 
the use of adjuvant growth hormone and or uh, before or during ovarian stimulation is probably not recommended nowadays. Again, it needs uh, more research. This is the same for uh, dihydrobiandosterone, dehia, and testosterone. The use of aspirin should be prohibited. Use of sildenafil or Viagra should be prohibited. Use of endomethacine should be prohibited. Finally, thank you very much for, for listening to me. Thank you, Professor Gabriel, for an excellent uh, presentation on a difficult subject. Uh, I have questions here. Uh, what do you think of estrogen pretreatment in poor responders to upgrade the, the FSH receptors? I think the recommendation is not to use uh, estrogen or uh, pretreatment for poor responders. Okay. I, I have a question. Uh, for you and for uh, Dr. Sonkara and for Dr. Temer. Why the short agonist protocol keeps on popping up every 10 years? Although we tried it for 30 years and it doesn't work. It doesn't work. So what every time, short agonist or flare up protocol. So what, why do you think it's coming up every, every now and then? Uh, I think people are trying every possible protocol as a research idea because we, you don't know exactly whether it will work or not. You don't know the new medications. So in the era of uh, HMG, they were using it and then they said, no, it's not good as long the protocol, then the recombinant one, they thought that might work with them, then the antagonist. So I uh, would like to compare it antagonist with the ultra short. This is my opinion. We've tried it for 30 years, Ahmed. It never worked, Dr. Sunkar. Um, I would say that with IVF, we should make it as simple and straightforward. So if we, so from my own experience, when we did the randomized control trial for poor responders comparing the long agonist, short agonist and antagonist, because at that time we were using the short agonist and we did a randomized control trial, we found that in poor responders, when the number of who sites was the primary outcome, we found that the short agonist was the least um, least effective. So it had significantly lower number of oocytes compared to the long agonist. And therefore we stopped using the short agonist. And I think even if you look at the Cochrane review, even if you look in unselected patients, the short agonist gives significantly lower number of oocytes. With regards to LIBA, there is a trend to reduction. So I think if in IVF, we should keep things as simple as possible, go with things that are uh, you know, giving us good efficacy and safety. And if you look at the evidence, I think there is a role for the antagonist, long agonist. Long agonist still has a role. And perhaps even in poor responders, which we think it does not, uh, you know, it causes excessive. But I think the short agonist has no value or no place at the moment. Uh, and I, I'm of that opinion, but I leave it to other colleagues to comment as well. Dr. Tamer, short agonist. Um, no, I, I, I don't like it personally, um, but I would go with uh, Professor Sankara's uh, comment here about simplicity. And my question is probably to her and even uh, for the Professor Gabil as well. Um, now, with 150 and softer stimulation providing less eggs but equal um, pregnancy rates, should you not go down? Why, why 300? Why, why not just uh, come down with the doses? Um, simpler, easier, cheaper and it's, it's as effective? Big question. Uh, Gabriel. Go Sankara, no question. Yeah, so, um, so uh, that is a very good question. May I ask, are you asking in the context of poor responders only or is it in the context of anybody? Uh, in poor, poor responders for, for, for this question, yes. Okay. So, um, that you're asking the exactly the same question on which we tore our heads apart and probably had fist fights and whether we should go with, you know, whether we should just stick to 150 or 300. I think uh, we all know that poor responders are not homogeneous, they're heterogeneous. You can have a poor responder who has an antral follicle count or AFC very low, or you can have a poor responder who is poor responder, but not, you know, is reasonable, maybe antral follicle count of six or seven compared to somebody okay. of two. I think so. What if, I think here, when the evidence is not black and white, you can use your own clinical judgment in the sense that if you have somebody 
who has an antral follicle count very low, AFC very AMH very low, when you think whatever stimulation you give, you're not going to improve, probably you can give a lower stimulation. But if you have somebody who is young and who has got an AFC of you know seven, who's still a poor responder, if you look at a Bologna criteria, perhaps I would go, although there is no hard and evidence, I would feel a little bit reluctant to go with 150, I would go for 300. So that's why when you look at the recommendations, the 150 was based was um, was by Frank Brookmans because he was the main author on the Optimist trial where they compared 150 versus higher dose and they showed no difference. But Dutch people do stimulation very differently. Their FET programs are have quite low pregnancy rates. So whatever you do, <laughs> the pregnancy rates will be low. So I think we should be a little bit cautious in taking their evidence to our settings and also their women don't pay for, their couples don't pay for the treatment. So even if they have one, two, three, four failed, it doesn't matter. But for us, it matters because our patients cannot afford that and our governments don't pay that. So that is one point. So, and that's why we said, you know, when he was going with one, we said that you can't say this. This is not, you know, for, we have to be a little bit practical. So we said, let's go up to 300, but beyond 300, it does not make a difference. Thank you very much. Gabriel, any, any work linking? Yes, yes. I, I, uh, yeah. what, uh, current literature suggests that uh, increasing the dose to 300 might increase the yield of oocytes. And in this group of patients, if you increase the number of oocytes, one oocyte, this means the 50% increase in, 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 in very chance. For example, a woman producing one oocyte, if you give her 150 and you could give 350 and you produce two oocytes, this, I think, will increase her, her, her chances. So that's the rationale. It's not only about decreasing the load or the burden of another province. I have questions here. So thank you for the nice presentation. Is there any work linking uh, Poseidon classes to prognosis as regards oocyte yield and pregnancy? Sorry, I didn't get this. Can you say this again, Professor, please? Any work linking Poseidon groups to pregnancy rate or over retrieved? Well, the, this procedure, procedure. procedure criteria stands for patient oriented, oriented uh, strategies for encompassing uh, oocyte number. And they said that the group that produced this has said that it's yet to be validated. Validation means that you classify women according to this classification and you find and you will find out whether there is difference in pregnancy rate or not. So it uh, has yet to be validated. So in EFRI last week, we were discussing validation of Poseidon criteria. Yes. Dr. Yes. Sunkara, is there any work that has been done to validate the Poseidon criteria? There are, um, uh, Dr. Maharab, there are studies, but not really randomized controlled trials. So the aim of the Poseidon criteria, how it came about is a little bit of the background. Because when, they, when uh, the, the Bologna criteria came with the idea of uniforming the definition of poor aware and response. What we saw is that actually didn't accomplish that because if you look at the criteria, Bologna criteria, and if you try to match groups, you will actually have eight to 13 subgroups. And also it didn't look into the uh, patients. It only said women who are older. So if you look at all the groupings, you will only come up with women who are older. But we know in our practice that we have younger women also who are poor responders. And therefore, it is more of a terminology of low response than poor response. And therefore, it we classified as the four subgroups. And the aim of Poseidon is to see how, in each group of women, how many oocytes you need to get at least one euploid embryo to result in a pregnancy. So it is more of giving you uh, advice in your clinical setting and how you want to stimulate your woman or how you can counsel your woman or if you were doing something like, um, P, uh, you know, if you're doing oocyte accumulation, how many cycles you need to get those oocytes to get a euploid embryo. So far, no randomized control trials, hopefully, but there are prospective studies that have validated this. It's, it's our aim in every after each webinar to come up with a study that we can do. So if you allow us, we'll contact you during the next week in a trial to formulate. A, we have a lot of centers in a trial to formulate a study that you think is good to be published. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank, was, you. Yeah. thank you. Yeah. It's an excellent webinar. Yeah, Mona.
you have a question? Uh, yes, uh, it's a question, a continuation of this issue of the dose 300. If I may say that our patients have a much higher BMI than the European patients. So we have a mean BMI of 30 and above. So I don't think it would be possible in poor responders to get a sufficient response if we use a lower dose. But what I want... Yeah, what I wanted to ask is a higher dose than 300. Is, is it harmful or is it just that studies haven't shown that it is that it's effective and it would be just expensive for the patient? Because again, I'm talking about the issue of high BMI. I completely agree with you uh, with regards to uh, 300 being the dose for poor responders. That's why if you see in the <clears throat> first draft, which went out for review and when it came back we said that you know we cannot just go like that because if this guideline is going to be the first guideline seen in every part of the world we cannot just say that 150 is the dose for poor responders and therefore we went with 300 but beyond 300 there's not many studies about the two studies did not show a difference but i don't think there would be any harm the simplest thing is that you don't know the answer 